And we're going to get right in the word. Well, in order to be victorious, you need to know the weapons of your warfare and you need to know the enemy. All through my Christian life, I've heard the weapons of warfare being taught, but never really learned how to utilize them. How many can agree with that? We know what the weapons of warfare are, but my God, how do I use them where I'm at in the nasty here and now? A good boxer, when he trains for a fight, he'll, especially a championship fight, he will get all the videos he can on his opponent. And he will study his feet, his telegraphing, his punches with his shoulder, his neck, his eyebrow, everything. His punch, he will learn everything he can about his opponent. The man that does that is destined to be a champion because he's learning his enemy. We don't need to learn our enemy because we were with our enemy. So we should already know his tools. For us not to know his tools is willful ignorance. Come on, somebody say amen. And then we come to Christ and we make bad representatives of the kingdom of God. I'm going to tell you something. We got something. Everybody that's sick, diseased, perverted, troubled, misunderstood, bound, and afflicted in this world needs. Amen. But we walk around like we don't. We walk around just as defeated, just as discouraged by life's problem as they are. Well, Come on, talk to me. Amen. I'm not talking about a Christ, a Savior, who went on the cross of Calvary and stayed there. Went into the tomb and he stayed there. The God that I serve rose from the dead. The God that I serve is sitting on the throne. The God that I serve said, all power is given unto me in heaven and the earth. And he said, I give it to you. He gave us his power. He gave us his authority. He gave us his will. And we're wandering around in squalor all the time crying about how hard life is. Well. Life is only hard because you choose it to be. And you can seriously say, well, Pastor, you just don't know the problems that I got. I had your problems, Jack. On top, I had my own problems. And I failed the grace of God. For 11 years, I served him with all my heart. And for five years, I went back to the pig pen. I had many, many excuses, but not one reason. Do you hear what I'm saying? I had many excuses that, that I wanted to believe sent me back to what I did. But the fact of the matter was I was tired of pushing forward and I wanted to quit. And I'm talking to everybody that's in recovery. You, you, have, you slip and you go back because you choose to. That bottle of wine, that weed, that needle is not stronger or bigger than you are. Neither is the allurement. But you got, <coughs> excuse me, you got tired right, right, right. and you wanted a break. Yes. True. You know what you said? True. Stop this world, stop this merry ground and let me off. Yeah. When you become accountable and take responsibility for your own actions, you are on the beginning, to, you're on the beginning of the road to victory. Right. Right. How, how many know we create our own crisis? Right. Almost every crisis I've been in was self-induced. Either by my actions of what I did or what I didn't do. For everything, there's an equal and op for every action, there's equal and opposite reaction. And if we are not on up and up and going up and up and doing the things that he's commanded us to do in his word, there is equal and opposite reaction to that and it's called a crisis. The enemy of our soul is out to destroy us and we're over here singing Kumbaya, Come by here if you don't know that. Come by here, Lord. Thinking that we're just going to hip hop into heaven or God's going to put us in a cocoon and protect us. No, the entire world is going through hell. The entire world is persecuted. The entire world feels the weight of the shoulders on them. And we should be able to shoulder it for them. With joy. Not saying we don't have problems. We got problems. <laughs> Hallelujah. I got problems. But I'm not going to allow my problems to dictate my joy. What can you do about it? What can you do about your problems? If you can't do nothing, you may as well rejoice. 
you may as well sing a song of praise. If there's something you could do, do it and rejoice anyway. But the crisis that we are in on a regular basis, and we're in a series about crisis, <coughs> this is what, I think our fifth week? Yep. Turn your Bible to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and there is nothing in our life. Let me share something with you. God's not dumb. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. How many good men we got here? Don't you know that every trouble that comes your way that this day has been already been ordained of God that you can handle it? It did not take God by surprise. There is a purpose for every trouble, every trial, and every crisis that comes your way. Much of the problem lies in the fact that we don't know what the crisis is for or we have entitlement issues, well, I'm a child of God. Why should I be going through this? Why not? Why shouldn't you go through it? Somebody else has experienced loss with no hope. You experience loss with hope. Guess what that does to the person with no hope? It can give them hope if you handle it right. If you handle it right. I grew up, you know, I remember in the 60s, men of God were held in honor and esteem. Today they're not. Because the way that they have conducted themselves over the years. But I believe that God is reversing that. God is reversing that because he's raising up a people that are accountable and responsible for their own lives. And they're going to project God's grace and mercy through all that they do and all that they live. All they experience. But the scripture tells you, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1. To everything... There is a season and a time for every manner or purpose under the sun. Let me share this with you. He's saying for every crisis, there's a season and a purpose for it. You may not like, enjoy, or want to go through that crisis, but with or without God, you're going to have a crisis. How many in this room only had crises when you came to God? No, we had crisis before, but we were delusional. So the crisis didn't mean that much to us because we numb our senses to where it didn't mean anything, not realizing that the crisis was robbing us of the ability to go forward in life. That's why some of y'all are still stuck in 1969, 79, 74, 59, 49, whatever it is. Because the crisis robbed you of the ability to, to, to continuously go forward. We should never be stuck. We should always be moving forward. So what is the one thing that will propel us to go forward in God? Many of us us in this room was right now, we'd raise our hands, we'd shout, faith, faith is it. No. We miss it in the Christian faith. Faith is a byproduct. What is a byproduct? Something that happens automatic. Right? Faith is a byproduct of hearing the Word of God. So it happens automatically. But what does not happen is your ability to change your character. That does not happen automatically. And this is where we're missing it. Right? A lot of people in church and in recovery, their character has not changed. I say the two because the two are closely aligned. And we're in both worlds. And unless there's a character change... You'll never understand. Now, you know what a character change is? We like to make excuses for it. Why we don't change our character. Okay, I'm going to have to get real with you all. How many believe that Jesus was the Son of God? All right. And the Bible says that he laid aside all his humanity, all, all his Godhead, and put on humanity. So what he did, he says, I'm taking my authority as the creator. I'm taking my authority as God and I'm setting it aside. And I'm sending myself to heaven, I mean to to earth, as a man. Subject to the like passions that we are. If he had to learn obedience through the things he suffered, what makes you think you're above him? I want to break this series down, so I want to take my time, but I want to break it down so we can quit sniveling about our life. 
and realize that God has a purpose for everything. And if we just be faithful, we'll find the reason why we're not finding the purpose because we're not faithful. Things get hard, we quit. Things get hard, we hang up our praise. Things get hard, we say, I'm not going, I'm going to go somewhere else. Instead of pressing forward, go over to Hebrews. <coughs> I'm sorry. Ch um, chapter 12. Hebrews 5. And we'll see what Christ the man had to do in order for him to understand God's plan. Actually, start in verse 8. <coughs> Although he was a son, he learned active special obedience through what he what? And his complete expectance, making him perfectly equipped to become the author and source of eternal salvation to all those who give heed and obey him. He fulfilled his purpose because he was obedient through the suffering. He understood that the crisis had a purpose. He understood that Christ had a purpose because he allowed the crisis to develop his character. The Bible says that trials and tribulations work what? Patience. All right, so there's a purpose for these crises because we are a very impatient people. Even in our prayer life, we pray for something one day and we think we got an answer. So we want God to move, move, move right now, right now, right now. <coughs> Excuse me. And this generation is even worse. Yeah. All the information they ever want is right there in an instant on their phone. We use the excuse that, well, I've, I've changed as much as I'm going to change. God's not interested in your outward external problems. He's concerned with your character. That's why we go through the problems that we go through. Our character. You ever see a man that was born well-to-do or never, you know, a man who was never, nothing demanded on him? Mama's boy? Can't handle the pressures of life for nothing. And you see a man who's had hardness all his life. The man is compassionate, carefree, considerate. Why is that? Because those things molded his character. The crisis of life, we fight the crisis of life because we think we have a right to a comfortable, peaceful, eternal joy life on here on earth. God's trying to do something with us. And then we make the excuses because of our culture. Well, I'm angry because I'm this race. You know, I have a propensity to drink because I'm this race. No, that's because of your character. It has nothing to do with your nationality, your background, how you were raised. Right. Has absolutely nothing. If that was the case, how, why is it that there are so many men and women today that were raised in abusive, alcoholic, addictive homes that are completely clean and don't, as a matter of fact, they abstain from all that stuff? Because it was a choice. So your life is a byproduct of nothing but choices. What happens is, listen to this, without a crisis, our character remains weak. We have no intestinal fortitude. And here, listen to the definition of intestinal fortitude. It's defined as courage and endurance to go on. When the crisis hits our life, we close the drapes, lock the doors, put a boring program on, and lay down and die. We have not developed intestinal fortitude. A crisis comes your way, you ought to tighten your belt. Well, you know what? I'm not laying down. I'm not dying. I'm not giving up. I'm going forward. I may not like it. I may not, I may not want to, but I know it's best for me to. So I'm going to overcome this battle, and I'm going to step forward. You have the ability to change, you just choose not to because we're, cons we're consistently taking the path of least resistance. One of the hardest things for me to do was change. Stop lying. Don't look at me like that. Lying comes easy. 
We don't even have to try to lie. Lies jump out of our mouth, and when it starts coming out of our mouth, it's too late, then we just keep going with it, man. Am I the only one? That was difficult for me. It was difficult for me to stop manipulating. <coughs> All right, I'm talking to a group of people that aren't here. For the first time in your life, you have the ability to change. I can remember night after night after night, I used to tell myself, that's it, I'm done. I'm going to quit this lifestyle because I know I'm killing myself. I need something better. I need to stop. Guess what happened in the morning? I set myself up for failure the night before, even though I was making the confessions that I need to quit. I woke up in the morning and reached under my bed, and there was my wake up. So now, for the first time in my life, because of Christ, I have, you have, we have the ability to change our character. Amen. Don't raise your hand, but how many of you know your character is abrasive? Domineering? And turns people off? Nobody in here, don't raise your hands. All right, but we're just talking about the ones that are not here. That's the way they are, right? It's a shame to know that stuff about yourself and do nothing to change it. Because it's not the other person, it's you. You have the ability to change. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are created new. The word creation, is a new creation, is a word called metamorphosis. It's the process. A metamorphosis is the process that the caterpillar goes through to become a butterfly. The awesome thing about this, the metamorphous process of the caterpillar to the butterfly is a natural occurrence. Never ever have I seen a butterfly, I mean a, 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 yeah, a butterfly say, I wish I was still a caterpillar. <laughs> and never before have I ever seen a caterpillar say, I don't want to be a butterfly. It's just a natural process that they go through. But yet, us on the other hand, God's called us to morph. That's right. And we say, I don't want to be a victorious Christian. <laughs> I like my wounds. I like my pain. I like blaming others. I don't want to be accountable. I don't want to be responsible. I don't want to grow up. Just want to be a Toys R Us kid. <laughs> you have, and you alone, have the ability to change your character. How many men have tried to change your wife? <laughs> Two bold, three confident men in here. The rest of you are scared to death of your wife, man. <laughs> it never worked. You could try to change, and your wife's. When are you going to realize you can't change us? You can nag us from here to eternity. We ain't changing by you. Only God can change you. Second Timothy, I'll leave that alone because I don't want to lose the women today. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I want to, you to know, you have the ability to change your character with the assistance of the crisis that come your way. It's not the good times that change our character. It's the hard times that change our character. If you allow it to do its job. Well... And stop blaming other people. Right. Gee, everybody knows I'm not doing well. I ain't been to church in three weeks. Ain't nobody called me. So what? They should, but they don't. So what? Don't use that as an excuse for you to give up. Change your character and be a part of the solution. And when you see somebody in need of a call, you make the call. Because you can't fix somebody by telling them what they should do. You could only show them by example. That was a hard lesson for me to learn because I want my wife to do everything I told her to do. Clean the house, why? Because I said so. 
Come on, don't look. I was that kind of man. Come home, I expect my house clean, my food on the table. When I walk in the door. And it may have been there, but it wasn't happily. But when the character changed, you don't have to ask for nothing. It's done for you. With joy. But it's your character. Not your wife's. Not your husband's. Not your children. It's you. That need. If you want to change in your home, it's got to start with you. you can't, it doesn't, and, and you can't say, okay, man, I, I've been holding my mouth for a week. When is it going to turn? You've been having that nasty mouth for 25 years in your marriage. And you think one week is going to turn it around? No. You're going to go through some crisis. Do you know what the crisis in your marriage is going to be? I ain't moving because I'm going to see how long this lasts. Talk to me. You have the ability to change your character. Nobody else does. And most times we fight the change of character. I know I did. Yeah. I fought God every step of the way because I didn't want him to make me a little punk. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to show kindness because to me, kindness was weakness. Right. right? I don't want to show compassion because people take advantage of you if you show compassion. You know, I had to be a Man's man, thank you. Who said that? <laughs> Amen. It had to be a man's man. It had to be a John Wayne, Big John Studd. You know, <laughs> couldn't show no expression because men don't do that. We don't show expression. We don't show fear. We don't show worry. We don't show those things. I couldn't live. I couldn't be real. But it was only when I allowed God to change me, when I surrendered to the breaking process, that. He began to do a work in me, and it started manifesting in my home, the church. Listen to this. And the Bible says, everything you touch. Psalms 1, whatsoever righteous man touches shall prosper. Everything you touch. Now all the things I've been trying to demand are happening automatic. The change, tell yourself, the change begins with me. Notice I didn't tell you to tell your husband or your wife. 2 Timothy chapter 2. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also utensils. Now, how many know he's not talking about silverware? He's talking about vessels, us. But vessels of wood, earthenware, some of honorable, noble use, and some of menial and ignoble use. In other words, there are some that are worthless. There are some that are useless. But he said, listen, <coughs> whoever cleanses their mate, no? Oh, their pastor. <laughs> Cleanses who? God, that's hard to do when everybody else is in so bad. Man, I could see my husband. I could see my wife's problems. Man, why can't I, I need to fix that? But you need to look at yours. Cleanses himself from ignoble, unclean, and separates himself from contact, contact with contaminating and corrupting influences. Influences will then be a vessel set apart and useful, or honorable, and noble purposes consecrated and profitable for the master fit and ready for every good work. Your character. We as a society and a church have focused on the externals of people's problems, and we work on the symptoms rather than the core. All right? We focus on, you smell like smoke. You still smoking, brother? You smell like you've been drinking, man. You okay? You got a problem? And so we tell ourselves, well, oh my God, I can't drink. But yet you still have the lust for it. So you tell yourself, no, 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 I can't drink. I, you know, I, I'm, the, I'm the different kind of pastor. I'll tell you, drink until God takes it from you. Amen. Well, why should I do that? Because the Bible says if you lust for it in your heart, you may as well do it. I've seen so many people come to church and say, well, I, I'm going to church and I can't smoke, I can't drink, I can't do this, I can't do because I'm going to church. So they put it down, but yet they're always lusting for it. And a matter of time, they're back there at it. God delivered me many, many, many years ago. Amen. I tried to go back to it. It wasn't the same because he delivered me. 
I put it at the altar and I never picked it up. The desire is gone. Do you hear that? The desire is gone. Stop focusing on your symptoms and deal with the root. The symptoms is sin. The root is character. We deal with the outward. Make ourselves look good. We sound good. We don't curse in front of certain people. We don't tell ethnic or racial jokes in front of certain people. The ones we know can't handle it. Right? We act right in front of certain people. That is behavioral modification. That's not a change of character. There's a difference. Behavioral modification means I adapt to my surroundings. Those people are called chameleons. A change of character influences their environment rather than chameleons being changed by their environment. That's what Christians are supposed to do. We change our environment no matter who I'm around. People will automatically say, <coughs> excuse me, I didn't mean to swear. I didn't say nothing to you. You got conviction because you see a changed character in me. Now, if I just have behavioral modification, if you're slipping and sliding, I'm going to slip and slide. I said, if you don't tell, I won't tell. And that's the way it is. We need a change of character. And there's too much behavioral modification. Focusing on the externals, focusing on the sins, rather than the change of character. That's why El Shaddai Ministries is not tripping on people in this church. Your lifestyle is your business. I have confidence that the Word of God can uphold you, keep you, and deliver you. The Word of God, not the man. Not somebody pointing a finger at you. Not somebody condemning you. But let the word of God come alive in you and character changes. You're going to look, so, man, what was I thinking? Right. Amen. I ain't even married to you, dude. Get out of my life. Yep. What was I thinking? I had a nasty character. So I settled for you. <laughs> now that my character's changed, I can do better. Yes. Come on, talk to me. Whether it be a job, a person, a home, a career, it doesn't matter. Right, come on. If you're married, stay married. Don't get rid of that. I ain't saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that at all. Don't walk out of here. You know. <laughs> Romans 12, 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, or 12, 2 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed. My thinking's got to change. My life's got to change. I need to change. I need to become what God wants me to become. Because anything short of that is a weak character. And a weak character will foster a hard heart. Listen to this. Do you know how many Christians have a weak character that have a hard heart? I'm not saying they're God haters. We get that confused. You can have a hard heart towards God and be in love with Him. True. That's why there's marriages that should have divorced 20 years ago. They stay together. They have hard hearts towards one another. But yet they still love one another. But they're insensitive, cruel, mean, and don't want to do anything for each other. How many understand that analogy? You could be all these things, thinking you're in love with God and willing to do everything, but still have a hard heart. Doesn't mean you're a God, a God hater. It means that the hard heart dulls your ability to perceive and understand. You're sitting in church, and because of a hard heart, because of a weak character, you cannot perceive and understand what God's trying to do with you. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Mark chapter 8. And we're going to dissect this 
so that it's plain for all to understand, even them that have a hard heart. We can have a hard heart and not even know it. Amen. You ever go out in a boat and you're drifting? You don't know how far you drifted until you start rowing in? That's what happens within our Christian life. You know, we don't realize we're drifting far from God until it seems like, oh my God, it's too late to get back. See, with the change of character, you're always watching what goes in the eye gate, what goes in the ear gate. You're mindful. Yes. You protect yourself. Yes. But somebody with a hard heart just goes with everything and anything until the journey seems like it's too impossible to fix. Mark chapter 8 and starting at um, verse 13. He reads like this. And he, speaking of Jesus, went away and left them. And getting in the boat again, he departed to the other side. Now they had completely forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them to the boat. Now these were his disciples walking with him, learning with him side by side, hearing the deep things of God through him. And you think that they would be sensitive to his wants, his needs, and to what he's trying to instill within them. And Jesus repeatedly and expressly charged and admonished them, saying, Look out, keep up your guard, and be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the, and the uh, leaven of the Herod and the Herodians. And they discussed and reasoned with one another, It is because we have no bread. And being aware of it, Jesus said to them, Why are you reasoning and saying is because you have no bread? Do you discern or, or do you not yet discern or understand? Are your hearts in a settled state of hardness? Having eyes, do you not see with them? Having ears, do you not hear and perceive and understand and sense of what is said? And do you not remember? And he went on to tell them, don't you remember <coughs> the loaves and I fed 5,000? Don't you remember the loaves and I fed 7,000? Many of the body of Christ has a hard heart towards God and don't believe that God can change their character. They don't submit. They don't follow through because their heart is hard. And here's four things that lead to a hard heart. One, he says you're unable to perceive. Secondly, unable to understand. Third, unable to hear. Fourthly, unable to remember. Here's what he was telling them. Don't you remember the miracles? I'm still the same guy that performed the miracles, and you're over here tripping on, you ain't got no bread. You know what he's telling them? You're over here tripping on the fact that you ain't got enough to survive for this whole week. But I fed you last week. So why do you want to have a hard heart now? I took care of you in your last problem. I took care of your last trial. Now your old character is going to come out. You don't remember this? You couldn't get it settled in your spirit that I'm the Lord thy God and I change not? How many Christians have a hard heart towards God and every time a problem comes, they fall apart like chicken little instead of standing in the faith and believing God? Go over to chapter 6. Chapter 6 and, and verse 51. And I want, he's, ta listen, he is talking to them. They have not yet had a change of character. They didn't have a change of character till the day of Pentecost. Prior to that, they never understood what he was saying, what he was doing. I'm going to show you the difference in their character. Mark chapter 6 and verse, verse 51 says, And he went up into the boat, and then he, the wind ceased to sank, sank to rest, as if exhausted by its own beating. And they were astonished exceedingly beyond measure. For they failed to consider or understand the teaching and meaning of the miracles of the loaves. In fact, their hearts had grown callous, had become dull, and lost the power to understand. A hard heart, you lose the power to understand. I just don't understand why this is happening. This, this church just lost it. 
No, your heart has become calloused and hard towards the things of God. It's amazing when a miracle happens how many Christians get so excited. It ought to be the norm. It's nothing that should be ignored, but it's nothing that should hit the front page of our headlines at church. It's something to be expected. It's something I expect to see happen on a regular basis, but it don't because we have a hard heart. We've got insensitive towards the things of God. When's the last time somebody spoke to you and they tried to tell you about their visions, their plans, their, how God's dealing with them, and you look at them like they're crazy? Because we have a hard heart towards the things of God. They were not yet transformed. On the day of Pentecost, Jesus had told them, he says, I'm going away. He says, but I want you to go to Jerusalem. He says, I want you to tarry for the Holy Ghost. Right. He said, when it comes upon you, you shall receive power. That word translated is dunamis. Mean dynamic or dynamite power. Amen. Explosive power from within. This experience changed their character. Uh -huh. Peter being weak-willed in character succumbed to the fact that he denied Christ. Peter being weak-willed in, in, in character thought he should defend the Christ and cut off a centurion's ear. Peter being weak-willed in character was impetuous and jumped out of the boat. Couldn't wait for Christ. Had to do things on his own strength. Am I talking to any weak-willed characters? But on the day of Pentecost, he stood up with boldness and with confidence when they came to find out, when all, all the religious leaders come find out what the uproar was. Peter, that same person that was in this boat, the same person who Christ had looked at him and said, your heart is hard and callous, Peter. The same one. He stood up and he said, in front of everybody, knowing that there was persecution if he stood up for Christ. Knowing that the, that, 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 that the Sanhedrin council didn't want anything to do with the way, the way of Christ, the way of the cross. Knowing that he could be jailed, he stood up because of a change of character and he said, oh men of Judea, let this be understood that this is, these people here are not drunk like you think they are, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days I will pour out my flesh, my spirit upon all flesh. Your young men shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams. And then he went on to make a declaration. And this is the evidence of the Jesus whom you crucified. He pointed the finger right back at them because of a change of character. A change of character is what gives you boldness. Yes. Right. Not because you're loud. Yes. Not because you can stand up. There's a difference between boldness and a holy boldness. Yes. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. But there's too many men and women of God that have been sitting in church for 10, 15 years and there's been no change of character at all. They're just as wicked and deceitful and untrustworthy as they were when they first got saved. Not you guys. <laughs> not you guys. You guys are not like that. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. As I said earlier, we like to feel good about ourselves. So we look at somebody else and well, I'm better than them, at least I don't, I don't go out and get drunk Friday nights. I seen your post on Facebook, think that looked cute. So we feel good about ourselves. Somebody's lifestyle on Facebook or personal is none of your business. Come on, talk to me. Why are you going to focus on their externals? You know what my being an addict meant? I had a bad character. Because if I had the right character, I wouldn't commit suicide on a daily basis. How many follow that? My inability to stop at one meant I had a weak character. Right? I've met people that could have a martini. A glass of wine. You want another? Oh, no, 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 thank you. Had enough. How? That was always my question. How? I could have one if it was this big, you know? But even people I've seen have a, they have a beer. They'll drink a beer. You want another beer? No, I want a case. I don't want another one. Just keep it coming. I had that weak character. Any other people had that weak character? 
So us being smart as we're smarter than God, okay. right? We're going to focus on the problem, right. the symptoms, rather than focusing on the problem. Right. I'm going to get you to abstain from the alcohol, that drugs, because that's the problem. No, there's something greater than that that's causing me to do this. Right. But for me to acknowledge that fact means I need to change my character mm -hmm. and be accountable and responsible. It's much easier to blame my mom because she bumped my head when I was five. Right. It's much easier to blame my dad because I have abandonment issues. Right. Right. I love that excuse. I love that excuse. I got abandonment issues. Stop allowing your woman to beat you up because she got abandonment issues. Everybody alive today has abandonment issues. I don't care if the man left or died early. We feel abandoned. Even if they were there, we feel abandoned because they weren't there the way we wanted them to be there. So we're all dealing with abandonment issues in one way or the other. But we as a church have been guilty for hundreds of years of focusing on the sin the symptoms rather than the character. When you read the Bible and you see what they were preaching back in the day, they preached Christ and Christ crucified. They didn't preach against sin. Not the way that we do today. They didn't preach against your lifestyle. They didn't preach the do's and don'ts. The Bible says that Jesus went about doing good. The Bible says that he spread the good news. The Bible says he went about destroying the works of God. How do you destroy something? By exposing the truth. By exposing the, you expose the truth. People look at the truth. They go, I don't want this lie no more. I want the truth. But we focus on the sins. And we tell somebody, well, well you can't be a member of this church because you still smoke. You still drink. You still dance. You still shake your booty. You still do this. You still do that. You belong in El Shaddai. You don't belong here. Right? Amen. Well, I'll tell you what, you do all those things, you won't be doing them long here because God will get a hold of you. God will get a hold of you and he'll transform your character. We need to stop focusing on the externals and change our own character. What happens if you've got 100 people that have changed character and you look at them, you know, I mean, come on, look around here, you could tell where you all been. Huh? We could, tell you didn't come, we, we could tell you didn't come from the country club, right? Or the state or federal country club, maybe, but yeah. <laughs> we know you didn't come from Tony Lima Golf Course, right? We know that. So you can see where people came from, and when you see them, and you go, man, God, what's going on? They don't respond the way they look. It gets people wanting what you got. Stop focusing on what people are doing or stop focusing on what you do. Man, why do I keep getting drunk by myself and nobody knows it, man? And then you're trying to quit drinking. The drinking is not the problem, your character is the problem. If you change your character, you don't want the drink. You change your character, you don't want the drug. You change your character, you don't want to do the things that you used to do. See, something happened to me when I got saved. My character changed. It wasn't overnight. But the big things was gone. The desire for drugs and alcohol was gone. The desire to beat everybody up was gone. I'm telling you, the hate left like that. That was major, because that's a driving force, right? The bitterness like that, right? Now, it left, but I had to still work at it, because it was not a symptom, it was the core that created everything else. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Your character, unchanged character, is stopping you from having the victory. All the promises of God are in him and they're right before us every day. We see what we should be. And we look and say, man, if I could just quit doing this, I'll be okay. No, change your character and it will be okay. Because what you're going to do is you're going to overcome one problem and you're going to develop another one. I don't use no more, but my God, I eat everything that don't move. 
Now you created a whole another problem. <laughs> Ephesians 4. <clears throat> He's talking about the Gentiles, the people. The word Gentile means a people without God. If you ask most people today, most Christians today, most teachers today, most pastors today, and you ask them, what about people without God? Are they going to hell? Yeah, they're going to hell. They're going to hell because they're a bunch of whoremongers, a bunch of liars, a bunch of thieves, a bunch of crooks. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't even mention that's why they're going. The Bible mentions that's why we go because we've been enlightened. But it doesn't say <coughs> that's why they go. Ephesians 4.18. <coughs> I'm sorry. In verse 17, he talks about the Gentiles. In verse 18, he explains it. Their moral understanding is darkened and their reasoning is beclouded. They are alienated, estranged, self-banished. Yeah. Listen to this. God wants them, but they're self-banished from the life of God and have no share in it. That is because... That is because of the ignorance, the want of knowledge and perception, the willful blindness that is deep-seated in them due to the what? Insensitive, insensitiveness of their moral nature. Has nothing to do with what they're doing, <coughs> but it has everything to do with the condition of the heart. I have a hard heart. I'm not going to believe God. So when you see somebody's symptoms, all you're doing is looking at the condition of their heart. But we look at the symptoms and we gauge one another. Your symptoms just show you the hardness of your heart. Well, I don't have a hard heart. But if you had a hard gut, you'd surrender it. Had a, had a soft heart, rather. You'd surrender it. You'd be pliable and allow God to mold you. How do I know I have a hard heart? What is your character when you go through things you don't like or you don't understand? I don't think I'm getting ready for church and you get some bad news. Staying home, man. That's good. Good plan. I've never found staying home to do me a bit of good. Because you're looking at the clock the whole time. See, I wonder if church is over now. I wonder what they're doing now. The message that ought to be on the lips of every single one of us is listen to this. Not abstinence. You know, when you're talking to your friends, they say, I, you know, I don't want to go to church because I don't want to go drinking. That's major for some people. I mean, I can give up their heroin, but you know, weed? Shoot. A beer here and there? Beer. Seven, seven? A drink here and here? Man, nothing wrong with that. And then we focus on that we try to protect our church. Well, that's right, that's right. You know, you got to lay all that down, man. I, I wish people would come in here directly from the club, the after hours bars, you know, on a Sunday morning, hungover, and to see how God sobers them up. Many of you in here already know what I'm talking about. You came to church high. And the Holy Ghost slapped you, straightened you up, and the message got to you. That's the power of the word. We got to stop acting like we're going to get contaminated by somebody else's behavior and pave the way for the word to change people's lives. Because how is the word going to change their life if they're afraid to come in here or they think they got to act a certain way when they get in here? Let the word get in them. Let them realize that they need to have a character change. I'm bringing it out to you today because most of us don't know we need a character change. We've been working on the problems. instead. Of, we've been working on the symptom of the problem rather than the core of the problem. Your symptoms, your profanity is not your problem. Your character is. Amen. Amen. Somebody who thinks they need to swear a lot has a very poor vocabulary. They refuse to grow. Go over to the book of Acts, chapter 28. The Apostle Paul. You know, I like to 
pattern myself after the examples I see in the Bible. And I know we go to the Bible bookstore and we've got all these things that we should be doing, things that we should be saying and how we should present ourselves. But there's no greater example than the ones in the Bible. In Acts 28, Paul had appealed to Caesar. That meant that they had to send him there because the Jews wanted to kill him. And him being a Roman citizen had that right. And as he was delivered to Rome, he appealed to the Jewish teachers there. And when he showed up, he began to appeal his case to them. And he told them why he was there. And he was telling them, he shared with them the one thing that was keeping them from understanding the gospel of Christ. And it was their unchanged character, their hard heart. That one thing that's keeping many of us in here from going to that next level is our hard heart saying, well, you know what? I'm good enough. If you're good enough, how come you're not happy? If you're good enough, where's your joy? If you're good enough, how come you're not winning souls to the kingdom? Because if you were good enough, that's exactly what you would be doing. You realize that you have the ability to transform somebody's life. You have the ability to, to flick, a, flick a switch and turn it on. But we're not good enough. But our heart has become dull. Our heart has become hard to where we're insensitive towards the things of God. The Apostle Paul in verse 25, he's preaching to them. He tells them, and as they disagreed among themselves, they began to leave, but not before Paul added one statement more. Then the Holy Spirit was right in saying through Isaiah, the prophets, you know what he's saying? The modern day preacher, I got one more thing to say. <laughs> They're ready to leave. They go, wait a minute, before you go, I want you to hear one more thing. The Holy Spirit said, go to this people and say to them, you will indeed hear and hear you and with your ears, but you will not understand. You will indeed look and look with your eyes, but you will not see nor perceive, have knowledge or become acquainted with what you look at all. For the heart, the understanding of the soul of these people has grown dull, stupid, hardened and calloused and their ears are heavy and hard of hearing and they have shut tight their eyes so that they may not perceive <coughs> have knowledge and become acquainted with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their souls and turn to me and be converted the word converted is translated changed a different direction right. he said they won't come to me so they could be changed he doesn't say they don't come to me so they can stop living that way. He said they be changed. Here's what happens. You can't lay down the things that are hindering you. You got to change your character. Can we help somebody? Have we ever tried to lay down an external sin because we knew it was wrong because we're in the church and it didn't work? Show of hands so we can help somebody. Come on, look around. You're not alone. We've all tried it. That's not the problem. I mean, it's a problem, and I want to minimize it. It is a problem. But you cannot fix the problem by focusing on the external. You focus on it, but you, what your focus is should be your character. Change your character. What does that mean? Change my perception? Right. That's how it is. Change the way you view things, because the way we view things is sick. The way we view things is wrong. The way we view things is to justify ourselves. A weak character can only be made strong by succumbing to the trials and tribulations of life and allowing them to develop a Christ-like character in us. There's no other way. You would develop patience. You would develop understanding. You will develop intestinal fortitude, perseverance. When boxers first start fighting, they used to have 15 round fights. I don't think they have them anymore, do they? I think they're 12 or 10. We keep lowering the standard. Right? This is too hard. You know, we keep lowering the standard. But back in the day, they had 15 round fights. Now when they first started fighting, 
They didn't throw in there for 15 rounds. At the gym, you're doing maybe a minute, minute and a half, one round, build up some endurance, two rounds. Before you know it, they're fighting six round fights, 10 round fights. Then all of a sudden, now they got the endurance to do the 15 round fight. And if they study their opponent, they win. Many of us don't want to get past the one, round, one minute in the ring. Because every time our time comes up for us to get in the ring, we cry, this is unfair. Why does this keep happening to me? Well, ask yourself that, don't ask us. I've had people ask me that a lot of times. Pastor, why does this keep happening to me? I really want to say, I really do, I really want to tell you why. But it's not my place. You know? Ask yourself. I woke up one day and I said, God, I'm tired of losing. I'm tired of being defeated. Mm-hmm. You know what his answer was? Change. Change your hostility. Oh, man. But that's the way I get things done, God. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Mm-hmm. People know when I'm serious, they better back up out of my way. Am I talking to anybody? Yes. That's a bad character flaw. I don't even have to raise my voice. Just give them that look. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, know what I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, your kids are little, you give them that look, straightens them up. <laughs> so we think we could use that with everybody because it works with them. Right. It's a bad character. See, a bad character flows over to every aspect of our life. We have a bad character. I get a 10 minute break at work, I'm take 15 because everybody else is. Right. Yeah, bad character. A bad character complains like everybody else does on the job. How many of you thought the job that you have now, you thank God for that? Oh my God, I thank God for this job, man. Woo! You don't know, Lord, you came through just in time. But now you got in there by contaminating influences and it impacted your character. Now you're just as negative about the job as they were with that negativity that you once called a blessing. Right. You, my friend, are a chameleon. <laughs> you should have walked into that job and been a light to them. And they should have looked at you and what is your trip? Why are you all the time singing and whistling and happy? Why are you all the time smiling? Don't you know they're underpaying us and overworking us? Don't you know they're going to lay us off? And you know the right character says, God brought me here and he ain't, leaving, he ain't making me go till he's done with me. And when he's done with me here, he's going to put me somewhere else where I can be a light. See, a right character trusts him, not the circumstances that we're in. Let me say that again. The godly character, the character that God's looking for in us, in all your ways acknowledge him. We trust him, not the circumstances. You tell me I'm going to be out of a job, but that's what you say. I may be out of this job, but he had this job designed for me when I was looking for this job. I didn't know it, but I was faithful and I knocked. But because over the years, my heart has got hard and I forgot that because I was dull of hearing and I became calloused towards the things of God. Much of Christianity has become callous towards the things of God. He is a way maker. He is a miracle worker. He makes things, calls things that are not as if they are. And we stand there with a cold, 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 calloused heart, wondering if God can. God not only can, God will, but he would only do it with somebody with a changed character. A changed character says, I don't care what I deal with. I don't care what I go through. Not that I don't care. I don't like persecution. I don't like it when people talk about me. I don't like it when people ignore me. I don't like it when I have hardness of life. I don't like it when I have to fight myself to be victorious. Come on, come on. Because sometimes I want to tell myself, yeah, you're right. Why don't you just...
quit fighting everybody and go with the crowd. You ain't no good. Sit down. You got a right to whine. You got a right to complain. You got a right to stop. You may as well say you deserve a break today. But my character today does not allow me to quit. Amen. Period. Let me share this with you. If you don't know this by now, you should know it. Alcoholic drug addicts are the weakest characters on the face of the earth because they can't handle pressure in any way, form, or fashion. No way. How are you saying that? I was one. I came back to the Lord in 1990. From 1990 to this day in 2016, I've withstood every single trial, tribulation, persecution, and lie that has come up against me in the glory and the strength of an almighty God. Listen. Only through a changed character, not through a mantra, a changed character, not through everybody here, but through a changed character. I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. You got to know that. Your character's got to know that. There is nothing that comes your way that can knock you down if you have a changed character. If you just think you're changed, the wind will blow you down. Because you have a weak foundation. You put your foundation on the sand. But my God, when you put your foundation on the rock, which is Jesus Christ, nothing will, the wind, the wind of uh, trouble, trials, <coughs> and tribulations will blow, but you're going to stand. That's right. What is your foundation on today? Where lies your foundation today? Is it on your character? Is it on your charisma? It's going to fail you. Because you're going to go through crisis. Just because you've been enlightened by a ser- with a series about crisis don't mean, ooh, by God, I got it now. <laughs> I could see my crisis coming a mile away sometimes and it still blindsides me. <laughs> Man, I thought you were coming yesterday. <laughs> you got me today. But my character today is never say die. Amen. My character today is I refuse to give up my song of praise. Do you hear this? And it was not a matter of will, power on my own. It was he infused me with his ability and his power to stand. How do I keep it? By stop making excuses. See what you made me do? You made me curse. You made me curse. You made me do this. You made me do that. No, you chose to. Stop blaming others and take accountability for your own character. Because when we all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, not for condemnation, but to receive your rewards, guess what? Your pastor ain't going to be there with you. I wish I could be. I really do. I said, I told him, Lord. I told him, I told him, I told him. Amen. That would be so cool. But he would turn around and say, and I told you. Yeah, so. Amen. Your pastor ain't going to be there. Your wife ain't going to be there. Your husband ain't going to be there. He's going to say, well, what have you done with my son Jesus? Well, I won souls. Well, what did you do? I, I, I healed the sick. Yeah, but did you appropriate his grace to change your character? Did you appropriate his grace into your life? Did you give out mercy and grace to others the way that you want it? Change of character. Well, what kind of character should I have to have? Well, the Bible says goodness. Galatians chapter 5, goodness. We don't want to be, we don't want to express goodness to others because it makes us look weak. Right? Go someplace with a bunch of people mugging each other. You walk around, hey, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Who's that idiot with the smile? Let's slap him. I don't care. Smile smiling away. Goodness. Doing something out of the goodness of your heart for no other reason because you want to do it. Right. Not expecting anything in return. Amen. How many of us could say, I have that character. Most of us only do things when we get something in return. You bless people, you fellowship with people that can give you back. 
But when you can give it to somebody who can't give you nothing back, oh my God, that's a feeling inside that you could never replace. To see the joy in their face when you light up, you acknowledge me, you recognize me, you see me. <coughs> I see you because you're important. Long suffering. Let me say it again. Long suffering. It's part of the character he wants us to have. Galatians chapter 5, 18 through 21. Meekness. God, I can't be meek. Well, you might be <laughs> Pastor Mike Meek. Yeah. yeah. It just means an absence of self assertiveness. Yeah. It's an absence of self assertiveness. Kindness. <laughs> you can be kind. It's not my character. No, you're right. It's not your character because you're still holding on to your unregenerated character. <laughs> And your unregenerated character is keeping you from the promises of God and stopping you from being victorious in your crisis. Right. Because when you go through these crises, you need the character of God. Love, joy. Joy! Oh, my God. Joy! Oh, my God. Some of you look at me like I have no clue what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> joy! We don't understand what joy is because we're too busy trying to be happy. We're too busy focusing on good things. Have a good day. Have a good weekend. Have a good trip. Have a good night. Have a good vacation. Have a good sleep. So our focus all the time on good. But we're about joy. The Bible says joy unspeakable. You know what joy is? Though everything falls around me, I know that nothing will come my way because I'm held in his hand. You know what joy is? I may lose everything, but I have confidence that my God is a restorer. You know what joy is? You could strip me of every single thing that I may own today, but if I was to drop dead, I'd be in the presence of an almighty God. You can't stop that from happening. That's joy. Many don't believe it, let alone think it. Because we're setting up our life as if we're going to live here forever. I don't know about you. I'm passing, I want to pass through for a long period of time. <laughs> you know, I'm like taking baby steps through life, man. I want this thing to last as long as I can, you know. But this is not my eternal home. Amen. I got me a home in glory. Mm where I don't have to do this. I don't have to struggle with this flesh. Right. I don't have to bring myself under subjection. Right. What are you striving for? What is your character have you striving for? If we develop the kind of character he wants us to have, do I'll tell you something, there would not be a church big enough Hmm. to bring in the people with untransformed characters. Do you hear what I'm saying? I didn't say people saved. Why would they come? Because your life would be an attraction. Amen. That's all. Why did they go to Jesus? Because he was an attraction. Why did they go to the disciples? Because he was an attraction. There was no promotion it was an attraction. How come somebody next to you don't smell like sin? Because you're not an attraction. <laughs> they had to look at you because you know what? I want what you got. I see peace in your life. Another fruit of our character. Peace. And you know what he said about the peace? It passes all understanding. You don't get your cage rattled. Peace that passes all understanding. How come you ain't upset? I don't know. We were just talking about this at the front door. Sister Debbie scratched Brother Rick's motorcycle yesterday. 
goes, oh my God, I'm afraid to tell him. <laughs> he looked at it and walked away. How many of you would have blew up? <laughs> oh my God, my God. <laughs> Talk to me. Years ago, we had a 1994 Villager, brand new. My wife and her girlfriend went for a ride. She pulls up the driveway. She got in a wreck. And Victoria was so afraid to come home and see me. She said, oh, my God, he's going to kill you, Gloria. Oh, my God. Open up the door. I said, you okay? She goes, yeah, it's okay. Peace. What kind of man are you? Expect that woman to follow you when you fall apart because something happens. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on. Peace that passes all understanding. Okay, don't get me wrong. There's been a time I go, oh my, what is wrong? Give me your keys. You shouldn't be driving anyway. Take the bus, woman. Hello? Transformed character. <coughs> don't tell me it can't happen. You won't allow it to happen. Love, right. peace, joy, meekness, long suffering. I'm missing something. Kindness, Kindness goodness, and self control. Self control. Oh, Shut up. <laughs> Quit running your mouth. Yeah. Diarrhea of the mouth. Yeah. Rain it in. Did you learn something today? Yeah. Come on, give the Lord a praise. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> I don't know 